The following video and continued growth of this channel are made possible by your support over on patreon.com slash 616 entertainment. Sign up today at any level you choose and help bring these brand new projects to life. Or if you're looking for a brand new t-shirt, maybe stop by prowrestlingtees.com slash 616 entertainment. I got you covered. What's up, Dan Dans? My name is Ian. Welcome to Mortal Kombat Monday. Oh my goodness. It is time to finish the Mortal Kombat novel by Jeff Roven. I think I started reading this thing on the channel like four years ago. Uh, and it sucks. It's terrible. It's one of the it's maybe the worst uh, book I've ever read in my life. It's up there. It's written horribly. It's almost like this guy has no idea uh, what he's talking about when it comes to Mortal Kombat. It is what it is. But look, this is going to be the final entry of reading this book, and then eventually, down the line, I will combine it all into one massive compilation, which will be the worst audiobook of all time. So some of you, uh, not many of you, but some of you have been waiting for this to end for a long time, and so this is where we wrap it. Now, as usual, it has been about a year since I have recorded or writ read anything from this book, so I don't remember any of the voices. I'm going to have to make them up on the spot. But here we go. This is page 239. We're on chapter 35. The casting of the transport spells was an enormous drain on Shang Tsung, and now he had no energy left for magic, or very much else. Upon returning to the palace from the fields by Mount Angelus, he was a little more bent than before, his skin hanging more loosely on his once powerful frame. As Sonya was carted away, Shang Tsung had walked with halting steps toward his own personal shrine to the deity. He had learned in his long association with Raiden and Kung Lao not to be optimistic, but he believed that after several miscalculations, things were finally going to go his way. The enraged Shao Kahn had allowed Reptile to come to this plane, and the bodyguard and Goro had cornered Raiden. Shang Tsung would finally be able to give Shao Kahn good news. When he'd reached the room, Shang Tsung shuffled through the orange-tinged darkness toward the glow of the brazier within the enchanted circle. Ruthay, he said, tell me, has Kano found the amulet? I don't remember what Ruthay's voice sounds like. He... Has <laughs> More good news, Shang Tsung had thought. Closing his eyes and projecting what little remained of his soul into the aura, Shang Tsung saw Kano and used that last desiccated fragment of spirit to send a bolt of red to bring him to the palace. But the wizard's soul had run out, and the bolt had dissipated shortly before Kano arrived. And now Shang Tsung lay on the floor of the shrine and awaited Kano's arrival praying that the amulet would enable him to finish the job he had started so very, very long ago. He didn't know how much time had passed until he heard heavy footfalls in the corridor, then in the shrine, and finally that welcome voice. Taking a power nap, Shang. Kano, said the wizard, craning his head around. You, you made it. Yup. And I got your necklace right here, he pointed with both index fingers, around my neck. Good work, Shang Tsung said, struggle, struggling to reach out his hand. May I have it, please? Sure thing, said Kano, kneeling and slipping it off his neck. He held it toward the sorcerer's hand, then suddenly snatched it back. Ah, uh, in a minute, I mean, after we do some major renegotiating of my contract. I... Don't understand. Kano stood again. Let me paint a picture. You're lying there on your belly without the strength to blink. If I blew up... Take two. If I blew pepper up your nose, you'd sneeze and fall apart. Here I am, tight and firm as a new wallet, and holding this amulet that I'd really like to learn how to use. And what I do learn, I'm thinking out of gratitude to the guy who's going to teach me, which is you, I'm going to give you ten... No, make it 15% of everything I get. Money, women, countries, other worlds, you name it. Shang Tsung shut his eyes. You idiot, he wheezed. You don't know what you're doing. Didn't I just say that, Shang-A-Lang? 
That's why I need you. We'll be a team, Lord Nelson, to use any talisman, the wizard said. One must have faith. One must believe. I do. I do believe I'll make a great world ruler. He bent and grabbed Shang Tsung under the arms. Now let's sit you up somewhere. Start talking about the amulet. And the room was suddenly brilliant with red. And a moment later, Shang Tsung was once again lying flat on the floor. Nearly two feet above him, Kano's feet were kicking wildly. You dare touch the master, Goro snarled, squeezing Kano's arms tightly before throwing him back first against the stone wall. You... <laughs> Wait, is this Goro or Kano? You dare! Uh, who is this? It's hard to keep track of, like, which voice I'm supposed to use. A timely and fortuitous arrival, Shang Tsung said as Reptile helped him up. I don't remember what the fuck Reptile sounded like. I feel like he kind of sounded like Shang Tsung. <laughs> a, a most timely and fortuitous arrival. Oh, wait, no, that's Shang Tsung. What did Reptile say? Reptile says, Timely, perhaps, said the lizard-like outworlder. But not fortuitous. We failed, Shang Tsung. Failed? How? Raiden was joined by two others, a member of the White Lotus Society and a creature who could teleport through a black aura. Through the world of the dead? Shang Tsung has fuck, they're too similar. Yes, though we aided by... Take two. Though we were aided by the ninja you sent, Sub-Zero, we were unable to prevail. Where is Sub-Zero now? We do not know, said Goro as he picked the dazed Kano up by the back of his neck like a cat, removed the amulet and dropped him to the floor. He fled and hid. Shang Tsung held onto Reptile's arm. He may attack yet the others, but we cannot count on it. They will surely be coming here. Goro handed Shang Tsung the amulet. We have the advantage of knowing the battleground, and there are souls in the Salinas. I have no idea what that means. Uh, who is this? It says he said. I guess Shang Tsung? That is true, Goro. And we have this, he said, holding the talisman before him and gazing into the milky rainbow set in a shifting pillow of gold. Go and make ready to prepare the, the palace while I consult with the Lord Master. And Goro, see to it that the body of Sonya Blade is disposed of before they arrive. They may divide to search for her, making it easier to defeat them. Wait, they killed Shang Sonya? I don't remember that. His energy slightly renewed by the arrival of his aides, even in, <laughs> even in retreat, Shang Tsung was able to stand and walk at a halting, funereal, I've never seen that word before, funereal pace toward the mystic circle. Did you hear Ruth A? I did, the demon screeched. Your victory and my freedom, oh sweet freedom, may be at hand. Not maybe, Shang Tsung smiled as he stepped over the circle and slipped the amulet around his neck. Are at hand. Raiden and his companions may inadvertently help us, my pet. In just a few minutes, I will use the power of the amulet to draw the souls from the living bodies, send them through the aura to Shao Kahn, and at long last, the barrier between the realms will be wide enough for him to pass through. Shang Tsung's heart filled with hope and concentrated evil as he stood beside the brazier, invoked the name of the Dark Lord, and waited for 15 centuries of waiting to come to an end. Wow. Waited for waiting. Wordsmith, Jeff Rovin. And then he heard a crash outside. Shang Tsung, said Ruthie. They come! They come! The wizard did not ask Ruthie to elaborate. There was no need. Reluctantly leaving the circle, he called for Goro and Reptile, ordering the recovering Kano to accompany him if he ever hoped to get off the island, and made his way from the shrine to the palace gate. You guys ready for chapter 36? During her three years of training to become a special forces agent, Sonya Blade had been taught and had mastered karate, kung fu, and taekwondo. She was an expert with martial arts weapons such as nunchucks, sais, and katanas, and had mastered all the traditional western weapons, including the knife, all forms of firearms, the bow and arrow, and explosives, ranging from sophisticated motion detectors attached to C4s to makeshift hand grenades made with coffee tins, brads, and gunpowder. 
She had been taught Japanese, German, Russian, and Spanish in addition to the French and Finnish she already knew, and had studied the basics of medicine so she could treat herself or any of her comrades if they were wounded in battle. But right here and now, she was on her own. None of those geniuses back at the Special Forces Academy had ever told her what to do if she were about to be sacrificed to a pigeon. And as soon as- <laughs> Jesus. And as soon as Baraka raised his blades, Sonya knew she had just moments to act. And she had to do this precisely, or she was going to be shish without having succeeded in her mission. When the knives pointed down, Sonya struggled so that the attention of all her captors would be holding her torso steady for the cut. As they did so, she tensed her thighs, how you doing? pointed her feet, and as the knives descended, made her move. Hooking her feet around the cage in a scissor grab, she swung her legs up at the waist. Her move caught everyone by surprise, most of all the two figures holding the cage, as it flew from their hands. Guided along on its side by Sonya's feet, the cage intercepted the swords in a heartbeat before they struck her chest. The pigeon was skewered, spraying blood and feathers into Sonya's hair, and the cage continued overhead, dragging the priest with it. Bringing her legs back so they were directly above her, Sonya did a split and clubbed the two hooded figures standing beneath them on either side of her. Startled, the other beings who were holding her relaxed their grip just enough so that the special forces operative was able to wrench free. Leaping from the top of the stone slab, Sonya landed on Baraka, scissor locking him in the chest, then bending her thumbs and driving her knuckles into the soft flesh of his temples. He howled in pain and then passed out. Sonya, having squeezed his ribcage so tightly he couldn't breathe, uh, okay, that's a full sentence, I guess. <laughs> he fell unconscious just as the enraged horde fell on her. Literally lifting the priest by the back of his robe, she slid her left hand around his waist, gripped his right forearm, forearm with her free hand, and used his sword to slash and fight her way through the crowd of hooded attendants. Sorry to cut me down- Take two. Sorry to cut out on you like this, she sneered, but I've got a hot date. She ran one of the somber hooded black figures through. Get my point, laughing boy? Jesus. Upon reaching the door of the temple, Sonya turned the priest toward them, put her foot against the small of his back, and pushed him inside. Then, plucking feathers from her hair, she ran off to find Kano and give him his long overdue desserts. Well, that was a whole chapter. It's time for chapter 37. The circle of fog outside the palace glowed with the reflected light of Raiden's lightning as the god materialized on the beach. Scorpion's form darkened the air and took shape beside him, in lockstep. The two strode up the woody hill along the dirt road toward the palace. There is no one in the trees, Raiden said after making a sweep of the branches. Either we are not expected, or they have marshaled their forces inside. The road curved toward the north, and the majestic palace came into view, nestled between the, t the twin pagodas. Between them, take two, behind them, Scorpion could see the ancient Shaolin temple honed from the rock of the mountain. It was a pity, he thought, that so, magnific so magnificent an edifice was used in the service of evil. Okay, that's a nice sentence. And then, in a day that had been full of surprises, Scorpion was caught off guard, when he heard a voice inside his head. Uh, I don't know what, to, <laughs> what voice to use for this, so I guess I'll just use, my, use mine. Use caution, my son, said the warm, reassuring voice of Yong Park. Don't, re don't recognize that name. They do expect you, and there is evil in every corner. Scorpion smiled behind his mask. I will be careful, father, he assured him. The iron gates were closed, and the gold dragons facing each other from either side... Raiden threw a bolt at the lock in the center. Flames seemed to shoot from the mouths of the dragons as one side of the gate rocketed back and the other flew off its hinges, bouncing end over end into the courtyard. God and man entered without missing a step. As they walked in, two wedges of hooded figures ran at them from either side, barring the exit and the way ahead. Raiden stopped, and Scorpion stopped a step later, as the figures just stood there. Let us take what is ours, said the Thunder God, and you will not be harmed. There was no answer, save for robes stirred by the wind as it swept th through the courtyard. 
And then, from behind the multitude, a voice rang out. Uh, I don't know, it doesn't say who this is, so I don't know what voice to give them. So it's just gonna be mine. While I'm feeling charitable, you may take your lives from here, but that is all. Oh, and in the future, ring the gong. Those gates are costly. Several of the robed figures move aside to reveal the wizard, okay, it was Shang Tsung, with the amulet around his neck, standing as tall as he was able. He was flanked by Goro on the right and Reptile on the left. Behind them, barely visible in the dark, was Kano. The amulet you wear was stolen from my temple, said Raiden. Return it, and Sonya Blade, and we will go. Uh, Shang Tsung, okay, I feel like he's got more energy now, because he's got the amulet, so... He's gonna be less like this. The amulet was recovered from the side of a mountain. <coughs> oh, my voice is failing me. <laughs> Shang Tsung replied, You have to claim it. As for Miss Blade, I have enabled her to reunite with her fiancé. You've wasted your time coming here, Raiden. Don't waste my time by staying. I will ask you one more time, wizard. Return to us what is ours. Shang Tsung seemed revitalized by the challenge. His eyes had some of their old fire as he said, Return it? Or what? You are two and we are five hundred. Scorpion shouted. I don't remember what Scorpion's voice sounds like. <laughs> what you do is against the laws of nature. You were, uh, were you five hundred times five hundred, we would not live. What? Were you 500 times 500? We will not. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I'm so over this. Shang Tsung put his fingertips on the center of the stone amulet and shut his eyes. It's an interesting proposition, my friend. Do you think you can back it up? Beside him, Goro began to chuckle. Uh, I guess this is still Shang Tsung. With this amulet and just one soul, I can open the portal wide enough to bring 25,000 warriors from the outworld. Scorpion felt a flash of weakness until his father spoke. He cannot hurt you, Sui. Trust in your power and his weakness. That sounds just like Raiden. The costumed warrior lifted his wrists, lifted his wrists so they were facing Shang Tsung. You talk too much, sorcerer. Let's see your army. Shang Tsung's pale cheeks flushed and his fingers, which were still on the amulet, began to tremble. You arrogant little godlet will provide the soul that brings them here. The wizard's hands began to smoke and his eyes fell expectantly to the amulet. The splendid talisman vibrated and shook against his chest, but it was only due to his quaking touch and not because he had tapped its power. The seconds took an eternity to pass as all eyes were upon and the pro I'm burping. and the promised soul rending did not take place. Then the qu the qua quavering quavering, never seen that before. Then the quavering ceased. Shang Tsung's spindly fingers had fallen still. The wizard's hand stopped smoking. His wizened features lost what little life had returned to them. Under the uncomprehending eyes, uncomprehending eyes of Goro and Reptile, and the blank stares of the devoted denizens of the palace. Shang Tsung, Dark Lord of Shimura Island, Master of the Hooded Hosts, Wizard Chancellor of Shao Kahn, raised his lusterless eyes from the amulet. It does not work, Shang Tsung said to Raiden. Scorpion said, we all saw. Tell me why, Raiden, Shang Tsung said. I demand to know why. Suddenly what appeared to be a small, dark, and unusually thick cloud separated from the fog around the island and crawled up the hill. It passed over the courtyard, heads turning as it drifted toward the final spire of the pagoda and settled on the sloping pent roof below. There, the foggy mass separated into two sections, one of which began to take human form and remained on the roof, while the other rushed forward toward the ground. The shape on the roof solidified, the lumpy gray contours giving away to smooth flesh and a white robe. It didn't work because you are a friend who, des who serves an... What? Oh, this is Kung Lao. It didn't work because you are a friend who serves an even greater friend, shouted Kung Lao, his robe blowing in the wind. The priest, Goro shouted. How is it possible? Dualities, Kung Lao said. He pointed to Shang Tsung. His magic showed me how. Fenga mysticism provided the ingredients, and lightning torn from the ceiling at the Temple of Raiden gave me the means to mix them. 
landing on the ground and reconforming behind Shang Tsung. Liu Kang said, We created what you did, magician, though not for evil. The White Lotus warrior leapt up to, to jump punch the startled sorcerer. But Goro stepped between them. He blocked the blow with one of his thick arms and, swinging his giant form into a roundhouse kick, caught Liu Kang in the leg. The mortal dropped to the ground, rolled away, and got to his feet before the giant could stomp on him. Above them, Liu Kang, take two, above them, Kung Lao lowered himself onto the balcony below the roof and swung feet first through an open window of the pagoda, while Scorpion ran through the break in the ranks of Shang Tsung's hooded hordes. As Scorpion raced toward Liu Kang, Reptile met him with a fan of sprayed acid. Scorpion executed a high leaping split to avoid it, then continued running toward his comrade. With an oath, Shang Tsung ordered his minions to attack Raiden. Then the wizard turned and, with another oath, pulled Kano with him and ran toward the shrine. Holy jeez, it's time for chapter 38. We have... Oh, God. We have about 38 pages to go. How do you like that? 38 and 38. Ruthay! Shang Tsung was screaming as he hobbled through the twisting corridors to the shrine of Shao Kahn. Hooded monks from the temple milled around aimlessly and Baraka was nowhere to be seen. But the wizard couldn't worry about that now. No doubt his loyal high priest had been drawn out by the commotion. Ruthay! The sorcerer cried, after uttering the chant to unbolt the doors. Something has gone very wrong. I'll say, Kano muttered as Shang Tsung gripped his arm for support. I've got a feeling I'll be lucky to get through the rest of my dough, let alone a chance to disembowel that fat lug who threw me against the wall. The wizard ignored him as he moved through the darkness with desperate haste, crying for Shao Kahn's regent, hoping that the demon could help where, inexplicably, his own magic had failed. Shang Tsung entered the chamber. Ruthay, I need your help, he said, hurrying toward the circle so his dwindling body heat could animate the flame and the demon. I'm too weak, my spirit drained. You must add your power to mine so the amulet can be activated. The brazier flared dully, sparkles of burning coal dust filling the air above it. The orange glow grew, and as it did, the wizard stopped. Through, though his eyes were not yet adjusted to the dim light, he sensed at once that something was wrong. There was a strange agitation coming from the area around the brazier, a disquiet that caused the air to ripple with a curious mixture of heat and cold. Shang Tsung's gaze went from the flame in the iron dish to the powdery circle on the floor, and he saw at once what was wrong. There was a break in the circle, a slash no wider than a human foot, but that would have been enough to jeopardize the spell, not only weakening Shang Tsung's contact with the outworld, but endangering all the other realm beings on this plane. If any more of it were destroyed... Shang Tsung's eyes wandered around the circle and settled on a sight that caused his heart to ache. Ruthe was no longer a mad amber ring floating above the circle. The rift in the circle had caused the once portly, parchment-skinned demon regent to coalesce into a mockery of his natural form. Lying in the dark at the foot of the brazier was a creature whose skin was white with brown patches, who was, patches, how you doing? Hello. Who was stretched and malformed from having spent 15 centuries as a prisoner of the ring. He now had a narrow, lengthened torso, a muzzle-like elongation where his face had been, and his legs and arms were of nearly equal length and ended in a paw-like appendage rather than his hands and feet. His once white eyes were a deep, sad brown, and his red robe was in tatters and hung from him like a tail. Shang Tsung looched forward. Ruthay! Sh Shang! barked the demon. I could do nothing. I tried to call you. I figure his voice should be different because he's changed forms. <laughs> Who has done this? The sorcerer gasped, stepping over the circle and bending beside the strange, pitiful sight. Tell me! Master, Shang, the demon whimpered as Shang Tsung stroked his sloping forehead. It, it, uh, okay, it was me, said a figure standing in the shadows. Me and my left foot. I don't know who it is. Shang Tsung fired a look toward the corner and strained in, to see into the darkness. I know that voice, he said through his teeth. 
his voice quivering with anger. Come out here and face me, witch! Sonya Blade swaggered from the darkness and smiled. The underlighting accentuated her expression, making it seem almost demonic. Did I upset your plan, guys? She asked. Only delayed them, Shang Tsung said defiantly. Maybe, Sonya said. But one thing's for certain. She held out her right fist, opened it palm up, and blew. You need a new mascot, she said as feathers floated to the ground. Hamachi! Shang Tsung screamed, his mouth and eyes wide with horror. He hissed, Sonya Blade, I will see you pulled apart by the... By the... Who? The Kwatanese Troopins. The Kwa... By wild Kwatanese Troopins. Your remains fed to my other birds. <laughs> no, uh, no, you won't, Kano snarled. She ain't gonna live that long. His hands slashing violently uppercuts... Take two. His hands slashing violent uppercuts at the air. Kano knee-kicked several times before rushing at Sonya. A war cry on his twisted lips and death in his eyes. Man, I should have brought my water in here. Chapter 39. Kung Lao found the pagoda deserted. All the, all the servants of darkness having been summoned to the courtyard, or... He saw as he exited the tower to what looked like an interrupted ceremony in the temple. Not that it mattered. He would have fought them all to reach his goal. But the cloaked and hooded things ignored him as he pushed through, heading to where he sensed he'd find his ancestor's amulet. The crowd thinned as he picked his way through the twisting hallway, where corners that had seemed from a distance to have angles were smooth curves when he arrived, and floors that seemed to slope down actually sloped up. This place is, place is like a nightmare made real, Kung Lao thought, the sick geometry reflecting the corruption of its master. The corridor grew darker and darker, and then Kung Lao saw a faint light through an open door up ahead. He approached slowly, listening to what sounded like a low, desperate panting among the grunts and blows of combat. Peeking in, Kung Lao saw first the kneeling wizard looking at a small, impish monster whose head was in his lap. Beyond them, the Order of Light priests saw Kano fighting with the woman who had been a part of the band of cutthroats. The young woman was attacking with a ferocity that had surprised Kung Lao, and apparently Kano as well. The criminal had been backed against the wall and was defensive as she battered him with high punch, uppercut, and jumping knee combinations that kept him completely off balance. Kung Lao couldn't imagine what would have turned her against her leader, but Kano's desperation was evident in the absence of glib talk that was characteristic of the man. Kung Lao's gaze turned back to Shang Tsung as he stepped into the doorway. Shang Tsung glanced over. Now my day is complete, he said, his nose crinkling, tone bitter. I expected you, Kung Lao, to come and profane this room with your sanctity. You stink of it. I only want the amulet, Shang Tsung, he said. Is that all? You've been defeated, said, said the priest. Is this Kung Lao? I have no desire to destroy you. No desire, Shang Tsung snickered. Rubbish. It's just beneath... Uh, it's just beneath the gooey... What? It's just buried beneath the gooey layers of the piety. Never seen that word before. Well, I won't surrender the amulet, Kung Lao. If you want it, you'll have to come and take it. Wicked life still flickered in his eyes. Let's see if you're as charitable as you pretend to be. Don't go near him, Sonya Blade yelled. The, the door between the worlds is still open and that demon's still breathing. Shang's not out of it yet. The priest approached slowly. What is wrong with the creature? Despite Miss Blade's optimistic proclamation, Shang Tsung said, the demon is dying. That woman, that stupid American agent with her big American feet. <laughs> Breached the enchanted circle and broke the lifeline between Ruthe and the outworld. I haven't the strength to restore it. I'm sorry, Kung Lao said. We are touched, Shang Tsung replied. I don't like to see any life end, said the priest. Even a life that has been devoted to evil. But there is always a chance for redemption. Shang Tsung snickered as he watched Kano try to vainly... Take two. As he watched Kano try to vainly regain the offensive... But after Sonya Blade parried two of Kano's desperate high kicks, she moved in with a sweep that threw the criminal back against the wall. She followed it with an air kick to the jaw that sent teeth and blood flying. If it pains you so much, 
Shang Tsung said. Why not help him? Use the amulet to reopen the lifeline. Kung Lao stopped outside the circle. All right, he said. Don't, Sonya cried. She redoubled her efforts to defeat Kano, throwing a scissor lock around his waist and bringing him down. While she drove the side of her hand repeatedly against his nose, she screamed, If you reopen the portal, who knows what'll come out? She's an alarmist, Shang Tsung said, his brows dipping. Don't taunt. Uh, I guess this is... I don't know who this is. I guess it's Kung Lao. Don't taunt me. <laughs> don't taunt me, priest. If you can help, do so quickly. Ruthe will not cling to life much longer. Kung Lao took a deep breath. I will help, he said, and stepped into the circle. No! Sonya yelled. She, let, she left Kano still conscious and raced toward the circle. You don't know what you're doing! Shao Kahn needs just one more soul! I'm aware of Shao Kahn's needs, said the priest. He held up one hand toward Sonya and held out, held out another toward the wizard. Give me the amulet and I'll send the demon back, Kung Lao said to Shang Tsung. You have my word. Sonya ran into the circle, breaking more of it and sending a tremor through Ruthe. Master! The dying regent shuddered. Kung Lao glared at Sonya. Come no further, he said. If you're on the side of good, you have nothing to fear. Bull, she said. My fiancé was on the side of good, and now he's on the inside of a brass box. Only his body, said Kung Lao, not his soul. He looked back at Shang Tsung. The amulet? The wizard bowed his head toward the priest, though his eyes never left him. Priest, Sonia said, drawing out her knives and approaching. This is a really, truly idiotic thing to... A flying kick knocked her into the brazier, which rattled but didn't fall. Kano followed it with a crouch kick to her chin. I really hate the sound of your voice, he said through bloody lips. When Sonia tried to rise, Kano tucked his arms into his chest and leapt at her, pulling his legs in for a, can for a savage cannonball blow. Hey, Jeff Robin knew that move. The two of them went flying across the room where they grappled in the dark. Kung Lao looked back down at the wizard, then reached for the strap. He removed it. Take two. He removed the amulet from Shang Tsung's neck and put it around his own. I can only reach into the white aura of the Order of Light, said Kung Lao. The black aura of death and the red aura of outworld are not known to me. What are the worlds... Take two. What are the words you use? Before I tell you, you must repair the circle, Shang Tsung said. Walking to the brakes, Kung Lao bent beside them in turn. It is done. Shang Tsung didn't even bother to suppress a smile as he said... The words you must use are, To the land beyond, beyond, I wish to go, From the dismal world of this and now, To the timeless realm where chaos is order, Where darkness is light, and demons dwell. Open your arms, lord of nether reaches, To embrace your subject. Hear my prayer. Accustomed to study and repetition, Kung Lao shut his eyes, bowed his head, Folded his hands above the amulet, and made his silent recitation. When he was finished, flames erupted from the brazier, raising high and crawling outward like the cap of a mushroom. Sea of fire, Ruthe! Shang Tsung cried as the fire spread overhead. The fool has done it! Kano, finish the woman off! Let hers be the soul that brings forth Shao Kahn! But as the wizard dropped Ruthe's head to the floor and climbed to his feet, the flames changed, and so did his expression. What fucking time are we at here? 33 minutes, how about it? Chapter 40, guys. How many chapters are there? I think there's 40, uh... 42... I think there's 42. There's 43. We're almost there. Almost there. In the courtyard, chaos flourished as a god and outworld demons, ghosts, the shells of the dead, Salinas... Mutant eight foot soldiers and mortals battled for control of the day. While Liu Kang and Scorpion concentrated on Reptile and Goro, Raiden flung lightning at the count countless retainers of the palace and temple, creatures who had no soul and had to be blasted to still throbbing chunks of dead but moving flesh, or Salinas, whose cap capacity for punishment was both awesome and brutal. The white and black garbed creatures kept charging Raiden, despite the loss of limbs and large slabs of sinew, 
and the Thunder God would re would take to, and the Thunder God would regularly teleport to a different spot in the courtyard or on the pagodas to resume his assault. And then all the monsters of the outworld, as well as Shang Tsung's dead servants from this world, stopped fighting. As one, they turned in the direction of the shrine. What's happening? Liu Kang asked Scorpion as the, as the seemingly unstoppable Goro and Reptile stopped fighting and looked toward the palace. I don't know, Scorpion said. Maybe someone's coming, Liu Kang suggested. Or going. Uh, what does Scorpion sound like? Or going. Do you feel that? Liu Kang stood still for a moment. You mean, like a pulling sensation? Yes, Scorpion said. A moment later, the smallest of the Salinas began sliding toward the palace, as though the courtyard had tilted and they were being spilled in that direction. They yowled as they clutched desperately at the trees at their larger neighbors, though their toenails clawing frantically at the ground. Something was definitely pulling them, and a few moments later their larger companions began scudding toward the palace as well. Even Reptile and Goro felt the tug. Something has happened to the portal, Goro said as a Selina skidded past him. Eh. <laughs> <laughs> the poor creature picked up speed and slammed into the wall of the palace, followed by other creatures who landed on top of him or crashed through windows and were swallowed by the darkness inside. Soon the wall itself gave way, and the outworlders piled upon it, sailed inward. Goro turned toward... Take two. Goro turned so he was facing toward the palace, and then leaned back, pushed his elephantine heels into the tiles of the courtyard, despite his weight, leaning into the opposite direction, and the strength in his heels. He, too, was drawn toward the strange force that affected all but Liu Kang, Scorpion, and Raiden. As Reptile was pulled off his feet and dragged toward the gaping hole in the palace wall, Liu Kang shielded his eyes from the sun and looked for Raiden. Thunder God! He shouted when he saw the deity standing by the gate, creatures flying away from him. What is happening? The Thunder God's eyes were changing from white to gold. Something has turned Shang Tsung's magic against him, he said. The portal is closing and taking its evil spawn with it. What could have caused that? Liu Kang asked, just as one of Goro's massive hands latched onto his leg, flipped him on his face, and began dragging him faster and faster toward the break in the wall. Chapter 41. There's a weird fold in this page. As soon as the flames in the brazier had reached the ceiling, with its decorations of demented constellations seen in the skies over Outworld, the column poured back in on itself with a deafening rush, snuffing the fire. The embers in the air around the brazier imploded as the air itself poured inward, as though drawn into the mouth of a huge funnel. Soon the entire circle was alive with tumult as the air spun round and round. Kung Lao stepped from the circle and stood by the doorway. Kano and Sonya Blade stopped fighting, and Shang Tsung also left the circle. All four watching as Ruthe wiggled, began inching across the floor on his back, and finally was sucked into the vortex so quickly that he left a brown and white trail in the air behind him. Shang Tsung asked the priest, What have you done? The wizard listened to the shrieks from the courtyard and the sickening thud of bodies slamming against the wall. Then he noticed that Kung Lao hadn't repaired the breaks in the circle, and even as he watched, particles of powder were already rising and then spinning downward in a glittering whirlpool. What have you done? Shang Tsung screamed. No less than I promised, Kung Lao said. I sent Ruthe back to the outworld, where he will revive. What else? the sorcerer demanded. Since I was already opening the doorway, I decided to send the rest of your servants back as well. But you lied, Shang Tsung growled. A priest of the Order of Light went back on his word. I did no such thing. You said you didn't know the words to enter the Red Aura. I didn't, said Kung Lao. But I am well versed in Shaolin mysticism, Shang Tsung. I knew that you are a being of deceit and trickery, and that the prayer you gave me would enable you to send a soul to Shao Kahn and open the doorway to our world. There were several heavy splats against the wall of the side of the shrine. The wall began to bulge inward. I simply spoke the prayer backward, Kung Lao said, which is the common way to reverse an occult process. 
by keeping the circle unclosed, I have enabled all of your guests to return home. No, not all, Shang Tsung said, desperately as he looked toward the wall, which was beginning to crack now. Goro! Reptile! As he watched, small pieces of the wall fell off, then hunks, and then blocks flew in all directions as a sea of Selenas tumbled in, along with the animated flesh of the dead that was about to be rejoined with its multitude of souls and free them to journey back to the black realm of death rather than damnation. Uh, someone says Shang Tsung, but I don't know who it is. Shang Tsung! The roar was heard even over the din of the vortex as Goro's huge shape came into view, his shoulder plowing through intervening walls, overturning chairs and tables, pulling down toward columns as he as he sought to stop his forward flight. Behind him came the struggling Liu Kang, who was still in his grasp, and Reptile. Shang Tsung, help us! The wizard brightened when he saw the captive member of the White Lotus Society. Goro, I'm here, the wizard cried. Hold on to Liu Kang. If you make it, take two. If you take him through, Shao Kahn will have his soul and return with all of you. As the giant was drawn into the shrine, Raiden and Scorpion both materialized in the room, facing Goro, their loins girded. No, Shang Tsung cried. You won't stop him. With the last of his strength, the wizard stepped back in the screaming whirlwind. Whirlwind, not whirlwind. His long white hair and rich white robe were... <sighs> His long white hair and rich robe were whipped round him as he stood there. Lord Khan, take the last of my soul to send these two elsewhere. Let my failure be your triumph. Send the red lightning to... Suddenly Goro and Reptile stopped moving. Shang Tsung's hair and robe settled around him in a peaceful disarray. The words stopped, and the dust of the circle settled to the floor like a fine snow, and Kung Lao took his fingers off the amulet, which glowed with cool fire. Shang Tsung, said the priest, there will be no more souls sent to Shao Kahn, not even yours. The door to the outworld is closed. There was a moment of thick silence. It was broken when Kano stood. In that case, I'm out of here. He said, vaulting through what used to be a wall and disappearing into the sunlight. Holy shit. Final two chapters. You ready? I guess I miscounted. There are 43 chapters. We are ne we're, we're really almost there. And then we can fucking put this book away forever. Despite her painful wounds and bloody jaw, Sonya Blade got to her feet and ran after him. Scor uh, Raiden and Scorpion faced the dazed Goro and Reptile while Liu Kang managed to free himself from the loosened grip of the Outworlder and join his comrades. It's over, wizard, Kung Lao said to Shang Tsung. Shang Tsung managed to put a little smirk on his long, shriveled face. For now. No, said Kung Lao. You have killed... This is my island, said the wizard. My laws. I've broken none. There are other laws, said Liu Kang. Laws of honor and decency. I have lived for over 1,500 years, my white lotus sprig. Don't dare lecture me about honor and decency. I have seen them take many forms, be interpreted in many ways. Some people say that the, de that the decent are merely those who have accepted what is, while the indecent are those who try to change it. Shang Tsung look at, looked at Raiden. Others say that decency is worshipping one god, while indecency is the worshipping of another. Who's to say what's right? The winner, said Scorpion. And from where I'm standing, that looks like us. Does it? asked Shang Tsung. Have you accomplished what you set out to do? Have you destroyed Sub-Zero? Show me his heart. Scorpion said nothing. Has Sonya Blade captured Kano? Does Shao Kahn still wield supreme over an outworld? Shang Tsung smiled. You have won. Nothing, little man. You've merely delayed me. I have time, and I have resources, and I will find a way to get what I want. That's a hell of a promo there by Shang Tsung. Liu Kang sidled up to the Thunder God. Raiden, will you permit this villain to go free? The deity said. We have no choice, Liu Kang said. But they're weak. We can beat them. All of them. Were we to take their lives or break Shung Shang Tsung's law, said Raiden, we would be no better than they are. 
I can live with that, said the White Lotus Warrior, as long as they're out of circulation. Raiden said knowingly, We have not come this far or fought so hard to remake the world to our taste, but to stop them from do but to stop them from doing the same. Liu Kang kicked a chunk of rubble on the ground. But the man is crazy, Raiden. He'll only try this again. You're wrong. Uh you're wrong again, lad, said, Sh said Shang Tsung. I will not try this again. <laughs> I feel like it sounds like Paul Heyman. <laughs> You're wrong again, lad, said, Sh said Paul Heyman. I will not try this again. <laughs> oh, man. His eyes went from one hero to the next. I've learned a great deal about my enemies, and I will most definitely not try this again. The next time we meet, all of us, it will be a more traditional way. Liu Kang threw a series of high punches and uppercuts at the air in front of Shang Tsung, causing the wizard to step back. Mortal combat, said the White Lotus warrior with a smug grin. I look forward to that, war warlock. As do I, said Shang Tsung. With great effort, the exhausted wizard held his arms toward the break in the outer wall. Uh, I guess it's just still Shang Tsung. In keeping with this exhilarating new spirit of de detente, don't I've never read that word before. I offer you the use of my vessel to return to shore. As for me, I'm tired and would very much like to take a long rest. Goro, reptile, attend me. Turning, Shang Tsung left the battered shrine, followed by Goro and reptile. The still disoriented outworlder stumbled through the wreckage, snarling and hissing as the thunder god at the Thunder God and his party as they passed. When they were gone, Sonya Blade stormed through the shattered wall. I've lost him, she huffed, burning off some of her surface rage by jump kicking loose bricks from the gaping hole. This island, it's impossible to make sense of it. This island, said Liu Kang. Hell, right now even the good guys don't make sense to me. I saw Kano go around the pagoda, she said, and I chased him there, but when I arrived, he was behind me. And then he was gone, without a trace. This place is strange, said Kung Lao, and one is forced to wonder whether it was the soul of the man that warped the island, or whether Shimura itself was evil and infected his soul. I don't worry about things like that, said Sonya, still livid but under control. She watched Shang Tsung and his demons round a corner in the oddly curved corridor. But I have a feeling Liu Kang is right. We'll all be returning to this island before long. Scorpion said, Not unless Sub-Zero is here. I'll not rest until I've found him. He may find you, Liu Kang said. He belongs to an evil ninja clan that doesn't believe in waiting for enemies to come to them. Every one of those assassins is worse than the next. Uh, Lin Kuei are not ninjas. Scorpion's eyes grew moist. Not every one of them, he said. There was... I don't remember what the voice sounds like. There was... Once a noble member of the Lin Kuei, a man who paid for that nobility with his life, but who still lives in his, but who lives still in his son, but who lives still in his son, Raiden said, uncharacteristic compassion in the golden eyes. Sonya gave one last roundhouse kick to a brick dangling from the top of the breach in the wall, then climbed back through. Right now, Kung Lao said, as much as I hate to say it. I agree with Shang Tsung. You agree with the wizard? Liu Kang said. Yes, said the priest with a smile. In one day, I've been a priest, a guide, a living fog, and a warrior. It is most definitely time to go home and take a nap. Raiden regarded, by, uh, Raiden regarded the holy man. There will be time enough for rest, he said. The long sleep to which all mortals eventually go. Before you close your eyes... There is one thing I wish you to do. Final chapter, Dan Dans. These are the closing moments of this book. This is four years in the making. The village of Wuhu. Oh, this is just me. The village of Wuhu welcomed the return of their priest with an impromptu celebration. The inhabitants rushing into the streets and, after, ra after having raided their compost heaps, tossing fistfuls of animal bones at him. Sonya and Liu Kang were walking behind him, with Scorpion trailing them both. The special forces agent seemed bemused by the outpouring. Back in the States, we throw confetti, she said, 
artfully employing a high block to knock away a pheasant breastbone headed toward her sore jawbone. There's less chance of getting hurt. It also has no significance beyond the act of throwing, said Liu Kang. This is the traditional Chinese way of saying that the people hope... Take two. This is the traditional Chinese way of saying that people hope he will stay forever, that his own bones will be interred in the soil of Wuhu. Be glad that this is the custom in this village, he grinned. In some places, they throw skin and viscera. Yummy, said Sonya. She watched as the young and old ran and, ho and hobbled from the doors of their huts, all of them wearing big smiles, some crying with happiness, all of them jo joining in... Take two. All of them joining the throng. And she saw their joy. She felt that although she hadn't been able to catch up with Kano, the day, the entire adventure, had not been wasted. They had stopped Shang Tsung, she told herself. And she'd helped return Kung Lao to the bosom of the people who needed him. She actually felt a little jealous. The last time I went home to Austin, Texas, she said, a whole two people came over to talk to me when I was filling up the gas tank. One was, uh, one was a boyfriend I'd hoped to avoid, and another was a girlfriend whose George Strait CD I'd borrowed. How would a hero's welcome have made you feel? Liu Kang asked. Self-conscious, Sonya admitted, though part of me would probably like it. She high-kicked a tossed drumstick over her overhead. I guess it can only happen in places like this, though. Liu Kang nodded. A small village where it's the wisdom of the local priest that is held in high regard. Not a global village where we hang on every word of radio commentators and television talk show hosts. As the quartet reached the Temple of the Order of Light, Kung Lao turned and faced his people. Sonya, Liu Kang, and Scorpion lined up behind him. The priest was still barefoot, still wearing just the robe in which he had set out, though now he also wore the amulet of the Thunder God around his neck. Oh, my wrist had to pop. There we go. That feels better. Kung Lao smiled broadly when he saw Chin Chin make his way to the front of the small crowd, then raised his arms and spoke. The holy... The... What? I guess this is Kung Lao. The holy Chu Chi once wrote, I felt obliged to go afar and ascend a famous mountain, forsaking my family's village and leaving this disinterestedness behind me. I undertook to cultivate thickets and to grow calluses on my hands and feet. They consider me mad. The divine process, however, does not flourish in the midst of the familiar. Kung Lao smiled. Beloved people of Wuhu, my friends and I are humbled by your welcome. We have seen the unfamiliar and have cultivated thickets of righteousness in a field of abomination, but with faith we have triumphed. Sonia expected the people to cheer, but there was only reverent silence. She felt neither strange nor uncomfortable, though she tried to imagine an American politician delivering a tagline like that and being greeted with nothing more than the affection and continued attention of the people. When we face the forces of Outworld, said Kung Lao, we were blessed to have you at our side. Take two. We were blessed to have at our side the most sacred thunder god, and before he left us to return to his holy mountain, Raiden charged me to do one thing for him. Kung Lao paused, his saged eyes passed over the eager and loving faces of the villagers. His gaze settled upon Chin Chin. The Thunder God asked me to select an acolyte, he said. One whom I will personally train to become a priest in the Order of Light. A person who, in time, I will send forth to found a new temple. I ask that you, Chin Chin, be that new disciple. The youth looked as though he'd just seen one of the sheep climb a tree. Whoop. Master, are you sure you want me? Chin Chin asked. It was Raiden himself who asked for you, said the priest. He saw the courage with which you faced Kano's men, and knows you will prove worthy of the task. I would be honored, Chin Chin said, but I am an orphan, and without siblings. Who will tend to my flock? I will. Uh, okay, no, this is just a mysterious person we don't know. I will! Kung Lao peered into the crowd as Chin Chin and several others, other villagers turned. All eyes settled upon a young man standing in their midst. He was slender but muscular, carried a long pole on his shoulder. From the end of it hung a bulging black cloth. The young man had extremely sharp and angular features, thin black eyebrows, black hair pulled into a pair of ponytails, 
and black eyes that shifted and gleamed like small pools of oil. When Kung Lao turned toward him, the young man held up a hand, palm out, to protect his eyes from the reflected light of the amulet. I don't know you, sir, Kung Lao said. No, most reverend priest. My name is Samo Huang. I have only just arrived in Wuhu from Kikihar in the great Kingan range. I was a shepherd there until my village was destroyed by an avalanche. I have come south to make a new life for myself, away from the sad memories in the north, and I would like to be able to do that here. I also find peace by worshipping at your temple. I have no fucking idea what's going on here. Kung Lao smiled. You, mo you are most welcome, Samo Huang. We would be honored if you were to take Chin Chin's flock. For a price, Chin Chin said. A reasonable one, he added under Kung Lao's reproachful gaze. But of course, Samo Huang bowed. Though his head was bent, his black eyes pierced the crowd, found Scorpion, and caught and held the fighter's eyes. Sonya simultaneously noticed the connection between them and felt a strange chill. Scorpion, do you know that man? She asked. I'm not sure, he said, but I feel as though I've met him somewhere. He must feel it too, Liu Kang remarked, the way he's looking at you. The priest told the villagers to go back to their homes, and as they quietly dispersed, Scorpion hurried among them to talk to the dark-haired stranger. Though it was just a short walk from the temple to where the man from the north had been standing, he was gone by the time Scorpion arrived. Moreover, no one had seen where he had went. Pretty strange, Liu Kang said as he reached Scorpion's side. You'd have thought he'd want to talk to you. Maybe he recognized, or, uh, <laughs> Maybe he recognized Scorpion, Sonya said as she arrived, and didn't want to be seen. Or, and didn't want to see him. Sorry, I paused for a second. Let me go fix something. I have Seinfeld playing in the other room for Patches Lugosi while he's napping, and I notice that it's off. Let me go look into this. This is this is a live this is a live fix up. Okay, we're all good. You know how your PS4 will turn itself off? the power save settings and whatnot, they turned off his Seinfeld. We call it Jerry. Tara and I just call it Jerry. You know, Patchy will say, I'm watching Jerry. You can't turn off my Patchy's Jerry. How dare you? <laughs> Where the fuck was I? Um, okay, here we go. Maybe he recognized Scorpion, Sonya said as she arrived, but didn't want to see him. She regarded her masked companion. Do you have any enemies? Only one, he said gravely. A ninja with hate in his eyes, the power to come and go unseen, and the kind of courage that would never permit a direct confrontation. Sonya said, It sounds like Wuhu just hired a ninja to be their new shepherd. It very well... Uh, it... <laughs> it may very well be, said Scorpion. Perhaps I'll stay a while to find out more about him. After bidding his two friends goodbye, Scorpion headed toward the brick building that served as Wu Hu's inn and the post office. It's funny to think of Scorpion at the post office. When he had gone inside, Sonya turned to Liu Kang, and I thought we were serious. We are, Liu Kang said. You were pretty serious back at the island, kicking bricks and timber all over, and you didn't exactly duck those bird bones that came your way. I feel like Liu Kang's voice is just gone. <laughs> I let my anger out, she said. If you keep it inside, like Scorpion does, you can make yourself sick. And do you think you've gotten rid of your anger? Liu Kang asked. Or is it like reptiles' venom? The more you spit, the more you make. Sonya looked pained. Ask the priest, she said. He's the only one who sees into our souls. All I know is, Scorpion probably wouldn't, won't get a good night's sleep until Sub-Zero is dead. At least I'll be well rested when I find that scum Kano. Perhaps you're right, Liu Kang said, but Raiden was right. The big sleep comes soon enough. Maybe Scorpion knows what he's doing. Speaking of doing, Sonya said, what will you do now? Return to Hong Kong? Liu Kang nodded. I have to find new recruits to replace the two men I lost here. I also want to check up on people who fought in the last Mortal Kombat. See if any of them are still around, if they can tell me anything about it. 
Raiden may think he won this showdown, but the next time I meet Shang Tsung and his group, I don't want them to be able to walk away. What about you? He asked. Will you stay here and look for Kano? No, Sonya said. I've got to return to the US and brief my boss about what happened here. Jackson Briggs doesn't like to be kept in the dark, and besides, Kano is like a rotten log. He may duck under the surface for a while, but eventually, he'd bob back up again. And when he does, I'll be there. With me right beside you, Liu Kang said. What do you say we get ourselves some McPhezants and tr Okay, this is still Liu Kang. What do you say we get ourselves some McPhezants and fries to go out and start a long walk to the train station? Sonya put an arm around his shoulder. Your treat? My treat. Let's go, she said as they started toward the inn. Behind them, Chin Chin stood alone outside the temple, watching from a distance as Kung Lao was welcomed by his monks. After a few moments, he became aware of a tall figure standing beside him. Did you hear? The youth said to the stranger, a beggar who was dressed in a black wool robe, his face hidden in the shadow of a leather-fringed cowl. I am to become a priest. I heard, said the stranger in a soothing, mellifluous voice. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Chin Chin's face was radiant. Do you think that my training will include... He hesitated. No, what a fool. I dare not even think it. But he did think it. Wouldn't it be wonderful, he said a moment later, if Kung Lao were to teach me how to use his sacred amulet? Think of it, sir. I would use its magic to help so many people in need. The stranger asked, Would you? Yes, yes indeed. Then heed well your fir <clears throat> Then heed well your first lesson, Chin Chin. The boy looked at him. First lesson? In what, sir? In where strength truly lies. The sunlight struck the perfectly formed mouth of the beggar at the leather edge of the hood. The flesh of his cheek and chin appeared unnaturally smooth, like glass, almost radiant. I'm sorry, Chin Chin said. I don't understand. The stranger took a step toward the boy. The amulet, the amulet you covet has no power, he said. Chin Chin's enthusiasm seemed to collapse. What do you mean, sir? Of course it has power. No, said the stranger, moving a strong finger back and forth. The power of the amulet is only as great as the power of the user. The stranger reached over and thumped his finger on Chin Chin's chest. The power of the amulet comes from in here. From inside of me? The youth asked. The talisman simply helps the user to believe, said the stranger. Believe in what? In Tien? In magic? In himself. The stranger said patiently, Like the smile of a child or a glorious sunrise, it helps the wearer suppress the evil side we all have. Like the cooling rain, it cleanses and refreshes the spirit, brings to the surface the strength and noble ambitions which are already inside. Chin Chin didn't know whether to be delighted or disappointed by the revelation, or whether to believe it at all. Yet something about the stranger made him believe, and for what may have been a moment or an hour, he stood peering into the compelling eyes of the stranger. Would it be rude to ask, sir, how you know so much about Kung Lao's amulet? Chin Chin said. Are you a priest or a pilgrim of the Order of Light? No, said the stranger. I am neither. I am an explorer, as much as you will become. I? said the youth. But you're wrong, sir. I won't become an explorer. I've just been asked to serve in the temple. And so you shall the beggar said, holding out his hand. Pinched between his thumb and index finger was a white cloth that fluttered in the breeze. Can you read this? He asked. Chin Chin took the fabric and looked at the black characteristics painted on one side. He cannot die yet does not live. Tis true. He is more than all, and all is Panku. The shepherd regarded the stranger. I don't understand. Who is Panku? He is the one for whom I search, for whom you will search. To understand Pan Q is to understand the nature of all creation. To understand him is to find the source of mortals and immortals, of good and evil. To comprehend dual nature of the universe. I don't know who the stranger is, so I'm just trying to do like a generic strange voice. Chin Chin looked at the paper again, then went to hand it back to the stranger. It's yours, the beggar said, holding up a hand. Keep it always to remind you that the quest never ends. 
His golden okay, so it's Raven. The golden eyes flashed underneath his cowl as he turned away. The stranger left Chin Chin more confused than before, but determined to work hard and find answers to the myriad questions that now raced through his mind. As he watched him go, Chin Chin muttered, I wonder who that... And then lightning flashed and the beggar was gone. And as he ran into the temple, Chin Chin knew to whom he had just been speaking. Okay, I lied. There's one more chapter, but it's only uh, about two pages long. Chapter 44, the final pages. And they're not telling me whose voices these are, so there's just mine. Another one? No, Lord, no. The darkness grew and then receded as Shao Kahn shifted on his throne. Okay, now it's Shao Kahn. These mortals bore me with their arrogance and petty requests. I don't blame you at all, sire, Ruthay said. It is not another wizard or witch, sire. Then what is it? The portly, parchment-skinned Ruthay kicked them to... kicked the hem of his robe behind him, and bowing low, his forehead nearly touching his toes, he approached the nearly invisible presence of Shao Kahn. Lord Shao, the little demon said, as always, commanding only a fraction of the authority he wanted or needed. I have had a message from from your servant in the Mother Realm. Ruthay leaned into a sigh that sounded and felt like a blast from the furnaces that flamed the pits of the Outworld Palace. What does the pathetic mortal say? Lord Master, Shang Tsung says that you have the last remaining soul you require. Very soon, and you will be able to cross over. I tire of his promises. He... he says he's sure of it. He was certain the last time. Sire, he... he admits he was distracted. He sought the amulet of Raiden to... to... to, to serve you, Majesty. Blind Ruth, eh? Shao Kahn said. He sought the amulet to oppose me, imp. No, Ruth, eh? said. Shang Tsung... Would not have dared to oppose you, Great One. He knows. <laughs> he knows. Ooh, I'm losing it right here at the end. He knows that he, he were he to try, he could not succeed. That is why he failed, Small One. I cannot be thwarted. Not by him, and not by Raiden. Y yes, Most High, Ruthie said fawningly. I will communicate that to his unlofty deceitfulness. Do so, Shao Kahn rumbled. And tell him one more thing, Flamelet. Anything, Radiance. Tell Shang Tsung that if he fails me again, if he fails to obtain a soul for me in the next mortal combat, I will find a way to enter the contest and take the soul I need. Perhaps his, little regent. Or if you tarry another moment, perhaps what is left of your own. Ruthay backed away from the throne, still bowing. A most reasonable and sane course of action, your godliness, he said. Though I must confess, mighty ruler of Outworld, I would look forward to such a contest. Shao Kong's ferocious teeth were visible as his mouth pulled into a smile. Ruthay, he said. I look forward to such a mortal combat, too. That was it. What you just heard was me closing the book and then throwing it on the floor. <laughs> oh, Dan Dan's, it took, what, four years to get through that book? And the, <laughs> the closing line is a play on words, Mortal Kombat 2. Oh, those final chapters were written better than the rest of the book was written. I'll give it that. But oh man, I am so happy to be done with that. And uh, now it is officially out of our hair. And uh, I will upload the full audiobook one of these days. You know, one of these rainy days in the future. I, I bet barely anybody's still listening to this at this point. <laughs> but there it is. That's the Mortal Kombat novel by Jeff Robin. We have finished it. Next week, we will finish the Mortal Kombat 11 story mode. And from there, we have more fun at our disposal. This is Mortal Kombat Monday. My name is Ian Danins. I love you. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>